Amen. Well, thanks for having a service tonight and coming like this. I mean, it wouldn't really be, well, we'd still be talking and sharing and having a good time. We've been doing that the whole time. And we've been around each other. So if no one was here, we'd, we'd be sharing. But it's nice to have you guys be able to get in on it. Amen. Amen. So uh, that's great that you came tonight. And I believe there's going to be some good things tonight that will be real helpful. Now, this morning, as you recognized, you know, in ministry time, I just ministered to a few different type of situations. And tonight, if you have something where your physical body just needs a real revelation that God's your healer, amen, amen. Yeah. a nice way to say it, then tonight just uh, have a full expectancy while you're listening uh, to have change start right there in your seat. And by the time we lay hands on you, just go out of here rejoicing and be free, okay? Right. Yeah. Amen. I like what Pastor's talking about, changing your atmosphere yeah. in your home, changing your atmosphere at work, changing your atmosphere everywhere you go. And I realize um, some of the simplest ways to put some of that in my vernacular would be to say, you just have to make better choices. Amen. Yeah. Yes. And the reason I like that, I like it for myself. Because when it comes down to my choices being better or not as good, then it, then it actually speaks highly of accountability and responsibility. And the reason why I like those words so much, even for myself, is because I want to grow. You know, if there's one thing that you could give somebody, John Lake made this, made this point, if there's one thing you could give somebody that would be better than anything else, it would be hunger. Because when you're hungry enough, you'll pretty much do anything you have to do to get what you need. Amen? And as long as you're hungry for God, and you're not snacking, you're hungry. You're flat. I mean, the, the, the little ones have eaten the big ones, and your backbone's been scratched, amen, and you're just hungry as can be. You're ready to get something. That's when you'll do what you need. And that's the reason why, in, in my own personal life, I can't get enough of the message that I'm preaching and sharing with you. I listen to it myself. No, I don't listen to me. I've never done that. I can't listen to my own stuff. People say, do you listen? I, can't, I just can't do that. I don't know why. I can't hear my own voice. Oh, God. I can hear my voice coming out, but I can't listen to my voice on a recording. But anyhow, you know, I love preaching this because I love it myself. I love to keep reminding myself, come on, Jim, you can make better choices. <clears throat> you need to be accountable for that. Are you being responsible or are you not being responsible? Now, in a day where people don't like those words, I understand how that makes people feel a little uncomfortable. But those are the words, really, that get right down to who you really are. What do you mean, who you really are? Okay. It's the person you really are that gets a prayer answered or doesn't. I'm going to keep going on this for a second. In other words, we portray ourselves one particular way in front of our kids. We portray ourselves another particular way in front of our spouse. We portray another, ourselves another way in front of our employer. And we really <laughs> portray ourselves another way when it comes to going to church. Mm. Uh -oh. <laughs> but who are you really? <laughs> when it's just you, your patterns, your routines, your habits. I mean, come on, think of it for a second here. There's, there's, there's a merit to what I'm saying, especially when you do your math. 720 hours in a month. Mm -hmm. If we give you even four hours a week for spiritual things, add that up, that's only 16 hours a month. Take it away from 720, you got 704 hours. What are you doing with your 704 hours? Wow. I'm not talking about four hours, 704 hours. Mm -hmm. Where's your time, your energy, your feelings, and your emotions going? Where are your affections? And the world anymore is just so illustrious, filled with so many wonderful options. I mean, now we have our phones. So at any given moment, if you don't have, if you're not, your mind isn't made to be on something, oh my goodness, take your phone out and you can connect anywhere in the world to anything. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's why the word accountability and responsibility is something I love today because I want to grow. I'm not talking just about ministry. I'm talking about me. I want to grow. Each one of us have habits and routines. Some of them are weaknesses. 
I don't want to be weak anymore. I'm tired. I don't like that word. That would be a dirty word for me if someone said, you're weak. Right. And I've had to admit that over the last few years, when I looked at myself, I thought, you know what? You're just flat weak. Do you like that, Jim? And then I had to look at myself and say, I hate that word. I can't stand that word. I'm going to do something about that. Now, if this is a self-help motivational message, <laughs> then I'm going to do something about, of it, about that is going to be a result of stirring myself up to have greater self-control and greater will power than I had yesterday yeah. to be able to withstand things that I really want to do today. But if this is about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we not only got saved by His grace, something we couldn't do ourselves, we needed someone to come along and do for us. If this is not only getting saved by it, but living by it and experiencing it, then my choices to want to change should be met with the grace of God. Amen. Amen. Because God gives grace to the humble. Ha oh, you know that verse, don't you? Yeah. He gives grace to the humble, and humble are people that are willing to be wrong. Yes. So that they can be right when they figure out how to make a better choice. Moses looked and saw from a distance that there was something burning up in the mountain, wanted to go see what that was. Just curious enough, like a little cat, to want to find out what's burning, but it's not consumed. And all of a sudden, you see over there in Exodus... And chapter 2 and 3, where it says, Moses turned aside to see why the bush burned but was not consumed. And the next thing it says is, God spoke. When did God speak? When Moses turned. It was burning the whole time, but it wasn't until he, I'm this direction, now I'm this direction. Good. Repentance is change. Change in direction. Pastor repented the service of just a few moments ago where we were loving on one another, shaking one another's hands, and he repented the service. He changed the order of the service by saying, now, go ahead and stand up. Jim Hockett is going to come and minister. In a few moments, I'm going to repent the service, and we're going to change the direction that it goes. And I'm open to the Holy Ghost to repent the service anytime we want to. Repent means change, 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 change the direction. Hallelujah. Amen. That's John the Baptist's whole message. He was the first Paul Revere, except he wasn't riding on a horse, he was probably walking. <laughs> a little slower, you know, than Paul. But anyhow, nonetheless, he was still doing the same thing. He was going through the villages, and his message was what? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. What does that message really mean? Interpret it in light of today's language. Very simply, he was saying, there's a change coming. There's a change coming. You know the difference of the change, probably somewhere along uh, maybe September 29th to October 5th. Somewhere in there in those couple of weeks, all of a sudden a northerner makes it all the way down here to make all the hot, steamy air go out into the <laughs> Gulf. And for a second, you, you can smell it and think, my God, it smells like fall. <laughs> and your mind says, there's a change coming. We're getting ready to change the seasons, change the seasons. That's what repent means. He said, there's a change coming. And the people that wanted to know what it was said, what's the change? He said, there's one that's coming after me that's going to open up heaven completely. It's no longer going to be a window. He's a carpenter. He knows how to take down a window, how to take down studs, how to take down drywall. He's going to open heaven wide up and so everybody can know God personally. That's the change. We're going from a couple people knowing God, and not even really well, to everybody. Hallelujah. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, they're going to know God. Amen. Intimately, Hallelujah. for themselves. Amen. That's the change. Glory. And Jesus came along, and what did he do? He shared a message to reveal, to make plain, to bring the Father out into the open where everybody could see him. Yeah. Even his own disciples didn't get it when he said, you've seen the Father. Well, show us the Father. It'd be sufficient. He said, Philip, how long have I been with you? Haven't you gotten it yet? I don't say anything unless I hear the Father say it. I don't do anything unless I see the Father do it. I've been showing you from day one what he looks like, how he talks, how he walks, how he thinks. <coughs> What's his purpose? So that everybody could get in on it. Isn't that good? Yeah. So now we go back to some of those words, and those words now aren't such, you know, they're, they're not cuss words anymore. Responsibility, accountability, those are words that will help us to actually find him. 
Because what do those words suggest? Let's make better choices. Choices that allow God to be God instead of choices that seem to hinder him and keep him obscure. Turn your Bibles over to John chapter 10 tonight. You know, your congregation, pastors, just happens to do this to me. So, you know, this isn't my normal. I usually am very nice and say hi and make sure everybody knows that I'm so glad that you're here. But your people just sit there and say, give it to me right between the eyes. So, so you know, it's just like the look on your face, what you transmit the aura that you give me, it's just kind of coming right back on you. So, as you, can, as you can see, I'm backpedaling, trying to get out of being responsible for saying all the things I'm saying. But nonetheless, I'm not going to take any back because it's really good stuff. And I hope you understand what I said, and I said it for a purpose. I love hearing this because I'm hungry. When you're hungry, you really want to know it's going to take a right turn in two steps and then three more steps take a left and you will be there because you want to maximize your time. You don't want to waste time anymore. You want to be able to say, there we go, there we go, there, uh, hey, I'm here. Versus wandering around in the, if you've ever been to Arkansas, you know you could be in Arkansas <laughs> your entire life and never get out. You know that. And if you don't know that, you ain't been in Arkansas. There are no straight roads, you understand. That's why people go and they never get out. Because they get lost. John chapter 10. Anybody here from Arkansas? You are? You are? You are too? Okay, was that accurate or not? You flew out. Well, just goes to prove that there are miracles in Arkansas. <laughs> All right, everybody's a smart aleck, you know what I mean? Okay, John chapter 10. Look at what it says here. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. <clears throat> now I want to share something about this. First, of, first of, uh, of all, yesterday I learned that as is a preposition. So praise the Lord for that. No, actually I, I learned that uh, just a couple of days before yesterday. No, <laughs> but that's how bad I am at English. But anyhow, I did learn that it's a preposition. And the word as means in the same degree and under the same conditions. So you could read it this way, in the same degree and under the same conditions, the Father knows me in the same way that I know the Father. Okay. Now Jesus is as a man, he's walking as a man, so he's not walking as God. So in other words, the idea that what Jesus is talking about is information is probably incorrect. In other words, Jesus doesn't know as a man, he doesn't know every hair that's on the top of, of God's head, like God knows every hair that's on the top of his head. So you've got to take this word know and dig a little deeper and find out that what he's talking about. Right now, brother, shake my hand. Now, I don't even know your name. What's your name? Patrick. Patrick. All right. That'll do. I'm looking at Patrick right now, shaking his hand. And to be honest, in the same degree and under the same conditions, Patrick has experienced Jim just as much as Jim has experienced Patrick. I don't know all there is to know about Patrick. He doesn't know all there is to know about me. But we've experienced one another in the same degree and under the same conditions. Jesus is trying to reveal to everybody that the Father God is someone that you can actually have a relationship with. He's a very real person, and you can experience him. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that's very, very important. Now, I realize, and of course, you know, in, in conversation, we've talked about some things too. You know, people can get to the point where they're trying so hard to go off into the spirit that some people can get real weird, real flaky. And people have a tendency to get that way anyhow. You know, to ask them a simple question like, how are you doing, Jack? He says, well, praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to God. God's on the throne. He's really good. I didn't ask you any of that. Can you just, can you just tell me if you're doing okay? 
you know, people can get real weird. And we wonder why the world looks at us and goes, really? You want me to be a part of that? See, everything I see about Jesus, he was actually able to sit down with Republicans. He was, not Republicans, but... but. I'm sure he would have probably liked to sit with them too. And Democrats and whatever else. Republicans. Okay, he sat down with people that were of the world. And they actually liked him because he wasn't weird. All right? So, I'm not trying to make anybody get weird by saying this. I just want to raise your expectancy that your level of experience of God can get more intense and more intimate and more real. If you say to yourself, I've never heard the voice of God, well, then you should. If you say to yourself, I really don't recognize His presence, why not? Remember what we said this morning, if you don't recognize His presence, it's because a presence other than His, you recognize all too well. If you're not hearing His voice, it's because you're hearing other voices. You realize in the garden, we ought to have as much today being sons of God as Adam and Eve after they sinned and were sinners. Because after they sinned and they were sinners, think about it. They still recognized where his presence was so that they could hide. And they recognized his voice when he spoke in complete sentences. It wasn't that they prayed in other tongues for four hours, came out with the word, God said, go. I'm so happy. Where are you going to go? Well, I don't really know. Well, I could have saved you four hours because the scriptures say over in Acts chapter 1, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's right. And I say that to help us realize the ridiculousness of how we treat little, tiny, minute, what we think are experiences which aren't really even hardly anything at all. Because maybe we've lost the expectancy for having a real, tangible relationship with God. You could say it like this. Somebody say, well, you know, I, I heard the voice of God yesterday. I, I believe I'm at, at least at the tip of the iceberg. No, that would pretty much be looking at a photograph of the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> because God is boundless and limitless. And your spirit is boundless and limitless. The only thing holding it back is whether or not you actually are aware of your own spirit yourself kind of difficult to engage something that you don't know exists, right? Jesus said at the woman at the well, remember all that? My father is seeking such to worship and they that worship in spirit and truth. The message Bible says you need to engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. Difficult to engage something you don't know you have, right? This is where choices come in. This is why Jesus would say this. I believe he would say something like this to stir us up to think, you mean I could experience my father in the same way he experiences me? You mean I could hear his voice just as real as he hears mine? I could recognize that he's with me just as real as, as he knows that I'm with him? And the answer would be yes. How would that change your life to actually have somebody walking around with you all day who actually talks with you? You don't just talk to him like a monologue. He actually has a dialogue with you. He talks to you too. Would that change you? Yes. See, the moment you become desirous of these type of things, that's the moment that you can begin to what? Open your heart and your mind and God can begin to do what? Show you how real it is. If we don't think it's possible, then we're just waiting around for an apple to hit us on the top of the head. And the amount of times something like that happens in your life are few and far between. That's what we've called the experiences for a lot of Christians are the ones that come and we have no way of repeating them because we don't know how they came in the first place. What we want is repetition. Repetition with God, where it's so real, we wake up every single morning and we're going to hang out with somebody. And we're actually able to function doing the things that we do, knowing that God's with us while we're actually doing what we do. Now that's pretty cool, because then we get the benefit of what? The more real someone is, the easier it is to actually trust them and work with them. So in other words, you look at some of this and you think of all the faith teaching that we've done that comes by so many principles and so many steps. And what I say to all that is, that in some sense of the, uh, of the imagination shows that if we have to use steps 
to teach someone about faith in God, then maybe we don't know him. Because when's the last time you actually had to use steps to have faith in someone you knew so well? You know, my dad always used to love go get milkshakes at Thiel's Dairy. Those are the old-fashioned dairies, you know, that still had, you know, the, the counters and the round seats by the counters, and they had those, you know, long, one stem, you know, that you put the big old uh, um, tin or uh, silver mixer in, and they, they'd give you a, um, a cup, you know, that, or a glass that would have all the, the cherry and whipped cream on top, and they'd give you a whole, the whole uh, canister that goes with it where you could fill it up two or three times. Remember that? Yeah. As a little kid, boy, I used to love going. Now, wouldn't it have been funny if I was in the car and my dad said, let's go to, let's go to Teal's Dealer. All right, I, Dad, I can't wait to get my milkshake. I can't wait to get my milkshake. Can't wait to get my milkshake. Can't wait to get my milkshake. I thank you that you're going to take me. 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 And Dad would look at me and say, what's wrong, hon? What are you doing? Well, I'm just making sure that you're going to take me. <laughs> See, the more you know him the less it becomes a routine and the more it becomes a relationship. And here's the, the reason why we're saying this. We're, we're preaching on this tonight to help you to realize it's supposed to be this real. That's part of the distortion of the last 2,000 years. Come on, Jude. You look over in Jude and you see in the, in the second chapter, because he's only got one, excuse me, the second verse. He's only got one chapter. <laughs> The second and third verse, it says, we must contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all given to the saints. Well, notice what he's saying. Jesus gave it to us 100% proof. It was accurate through Christ, but it's already been distorted. So we have to contend to bring it back to where it was when he gave us the faith. And how did Jesus give us the faith? He tried to help us to all realize his father was really, 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 really real. Yeah. That he was actually conscious of his dad at all times. He didn't do anything unless he saw his father do it. <clears throat> he didn't say anything unless he heard his father say it. So what kind of connection do you think he had? It was really good. Has anybody got a cell phone on him real quick? Hand me. I left mine in the pastor's office. Anybody got one? Here you go. Thank you. Now this cell phone has a wonderful power in it to connect to the internet all over the world. You could find things on another part of, the, uh, of another continent just by connecting to the internet. The problem with this phone is it needs a connection. If the reception is low, this phone turns into pretty much of a useless whatever. You know, I was in South Carolina, in Buford, South Carolina, and I swear that, you know, they're back in the Stone Ages. I couldn't get a reception for anything. And so nothing was coming in and nothing was going out. I just happened to be going over a causeway, and all of a sudden, I, I had my phone in my pocket. <laughs> I pulled over real quick, stuck my phone out the window like this. All of a sudden, all these messages came in, and all my messages went, shoo, shoo, shoo. they went out. Because I had some reception right there in that little causeway. So it was useless until I could get a reception. Now, what's really cool about God is, and this is what he did by his grace, when he saved you, he put a tower on your back. AT&T, Verizon, whatever it is that you like. <laughs> whatever it is that you, that this is a what? This is a Samsung, AT&T, Verizon. Which one? Uh, T-Mobile. T-Mobile, sorry. Anyhow, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So he stuck a T-Mobile tower on your back so that you would have five bars from him to you at all times. Woo! God never loses his bars. He always has full reception toward you. Why? Because he rigged it so that he would never lose his reception with you. Hallelujah. Well, I know you like that part, and I'm glad that you're enjoying that, but here's where we have to get real serious about things. How many bars do you have? Your bars have to do with your choice. And if you're making choices that enhance and protect your relationship with God, guess what? Bars start going up. No, this isn't about performance. This isn't about you earning your bars. It's about the bars are there, the cell tower's there. How connected are you on a regular basis? See, this comes back down to a couple simple thoughts. 
Every single day you wake up, from the moment you make the first decision to get out of bed, sometimes that may be after a few decisions to stay in bed a few moments. <laughs> but when you finally make the decision that you have to or you're willing to get out, from that moment on, you'll begin to make hundreds, if not thousands, of choices before noon. Most of them are, are subconscious choices. You're not even aware you're doing it because they're all entangled in your routines and habits. You know, some of you may walk out to the coffee pot hardly able to do anything, but you somehow can turn and can make it to the pot, click it on, and walk back before you're really awake. Because you've done so many times. And look at how many choices you were making just to turn the coffee pot on. Simple, but very interesting that those choices we make between when we get up until noon begin to define your day. Whether or not God is involved and there's a tangibility of the spirit and your connection has bars or whether or not you're swallowed up in your routines and your habits that are of the flesh and that are of the world and there's no reception at all. God, oh. God, that's what I was doing down there in South Carolina. Honey, I'll call you later. It was that bad. Because I had one little bar going. Dee -dee, dee -dee, dee -dee, dee -dee. One little bar. Well, when I got a place where there were five bars, I could literally not only call my wife and connect with her, I could connect with people all over the world if I wanted to. Because now my signal was strong. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Now, let me ask you a question again. It goes back to this morning, but I'll ask you to turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 to explain it. Let me ask you a simple little question here. Remember, when did Adam and Eve recognize they had physical bodies? After they ate the apple, after they sinned, which sin is just simply a what? A bad choice. Sin is a bad choice that's of the flesh and of the world. Not everything of the flesh and of the world necessarily has to be bad, but things that aren't even bad can become bad because they become your priority and then you put God on a list. There is no list when it comes to God. I mean, even thinking of things the way Jesus put it, seek first the kingdom of God, that was before he went to the cross. After the cross, it's not seek first the kingdom of God, it's pretty much seek only the kingdom of God and his righteousness. There's nothing else that even compares. So, so many of the things that we do aren't necessarily sinful, but they become sin in that they cause us to turn our back on the Lord. So, you may be feeling real good about the fact, you know, I don't sin, I don't do any of the top ten. The Ten Commandments, you know. But one of the things that we find ourselves doing that clicks us away from how real God can be is by turning our affections toward the flesh and the world, we're turning away from Him. Amen. See, if you were hanging out with me on a regular basis, let's just say we took one day, you're hanging with me all day long because I'm doing things you want to learn how to do, and I talk to you a total of 45 seconds through the whole day. <laughs> then what have I done? I've ignored you. How's our connection at that point? Not very good. You want to do it again tomorrow? I don't think so. Now you understand why. Aren't we all thankful that the Lord's long-suffering and love toward us? Oh, my goodness. Yes, thank you, Lord. It makes you want to thank Him. And that's one of the reasons why you have to understand that all sins are forgiven. Because God knew we were going to do a bunch of it. Sin is what? Bad choices. So God forgave us all our bad choices to do what? So that at a moment's no notice, you could repent and immediately find grace again. See, God wants you so badly to be in His presence because He knows it's in His presence that there's fullness of joy and that there's change. How can you accurately make choices about the world that we have learned to be the reality that all of us know so well... 
how can you make accurate choices unless you find the real reality? Because the moment you find the real reality, you'll look back at things you were longing to do and go, oh, that's not necessarily as fun anymore. Because God's a whole lot more fun. Right? Yeah. You'll start making better choices just out of the fact that you're experiencing something that's more real than the flesh and the world. Very difficult to tell someone that if they've never experienced God at all. And that is part of the what? That's part of the distortion that's come through 2,000 years of what we call Christianity. The idea that salvation isn't necessarily a real, live, wonderful meeting of God where he becomes real in your life. And the more technology, the worse things are going to be. Let me ask you a question, very simple. You would know the answer to this because you lived in New York. Times Square on a beautiful, clear night. Can you see the stars? No. No. Why? All the buildings and lights. Who made those lights? He did. He made the luminescent lights that are on the billboards. No, man made those. Okay, now let's go 30 miles west, upstate New York, out there into the countryside. Look up on a clear night to see those stars. Can you see them? Oh my goodness, of course. It's like immediate blanket of stars. God made the country, man made the city. The closer that you're attached to society and the life that man has made, the less chance you're going to have of connecting with God. Yeah. Putting this underneath your chair. No it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what does it say? The more you recognize that and pull back into a simple life, the more all of a sudden God becomes real. It's a teeter-totter. Yeah. Swings both ways. Why do the scriptures say right after we learn this wonderful thought that we walk by what? Hey. And not by sight. Sight could also be the five physical senses, right? right. right. Let's see if we can't get them. Taste, touch, smell, hearing, and seeing. Now, do you really think that the shell of who you really are has the advantage of senses to detect the world that you're in, but your spirit's just this blob on a pedestal or some wisp of wind that has nothing? So to walk by faith is just this all the time. Let me ask you a question. Do you own a car? Yes. Are you a car? No. But you own a car. Mm -hmm. Do you drive the car or does the car drive you? Would it be really bad if you let the car drive you, especially if you're up on top of a real big hill and there's a 90 degree turn at the bottom and there's a big oak tree? <laughs> wee, 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 like a little piggy that goes all the way home, took your hands off the wheel, feet off the pedal, and just let her rip. Let's just see what happens. That'd be really bad, wouldn't it? Yeah. You want to make sure you're what? In control of driving the car. Your body is the car. Amen. You are your spirit. Yeah. Yeah. You are not the body. Glory. The body is the vehicle. The real you is the person inside. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, there's no chance at all of someone driving their car if they don't know that they're not the car. Right. That's good. So the car will always drive them. So when you find out that you're not the car, your body is not the real you. It's the reflection of you. So how in the world could the reflection of you have these senses, but the real you doesn't have any at all? No, quite on the contrary. Your spirit smells, your spirit sees, your spirit feels, your spirit hears, and your spirit tastes. I mean, I'm going to be pretty disappointed if I get to heaven, and I know I will, and I find this amazing and beautiful fruit tree, and I go ahead and take a bite of it, and there's no taste. I mean, oh, really, Lord? <laughs> I've been wanting to walk through this amazing garden that Brother Hagen talked about where the flowers just seemed to be so amazing and the color was real and you walk through it and the flowers just walk with you. I've been wanting to walk through something like that and smell it, but there's no smell. Terrible. Terrible, right? The reason why the senses of your flesh 
are what they are is because it's a copy of the senses of your spirit. So when you walk by faith, you're walking by the senses of your spirit instead of the senses of your flesh. And the next verse helps you with that. To be absent from the body is to be what? We use that for death, but why not use it for life? The less attached you are to the body, the greater chance you have of being what? In the presence of the Lord. Isn't that good? Okay, let's go over here to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Give me a few more minutes and we're, we'll get to where we need to get to. In the Amplified, in verse 16, it says, Consequently, from now on, we estimate and regard no one from a purely human point of view in terms of natural standards of value. Wow. King James says, We judge no man after the flesh. What's he trying to say? The moment you get born again, you come alive on the inside. God makes that man on the inside that was a sin nature being out of touch with God. All of a sudden, he replaces that person. In other words, you could say it like this. He annihilates that person, and in its place, there's a new birth. Amen. Amen. That spiritual man, my goodness, is a Christ man. He's born of the same DNA as Jesus Christ. That spiritual man not only is resurrected, but Jesus comes, steps inside that spiritual man by the Holy Ghost and lives inside your spirit, and two become one. Glory, glory, glory. I'm talking about a spiritual tower strapped to my back. Five bars on me. Glory to God. And especially when things are really simple, five bars on God. So now that you're restored to your rightful place, where it's not about the body, just like Adam. I mean, if he found out that through sin he had a body, what does it say that he didn't really need to recognize that he had a body? Because he's too, in, too um, you could say, overwhelmed with enjoying his spiritual connection. What's the first thing that he lost when he sinned? He lost his clothes. If you didn't, haven't figured this out, the devil's always trying to take clothes off. God's always trying to put them back on. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I mean, if somebody gets you in a situation where you're trying to take your clothes off, no. That's the devil. Okay? Keep them on. Keep them on. It is the truth. Mad Mad Gadara, he's got all these devils in him, and he's naked. When he came to himself, first thing he did was, holy smokes, put some clothes on. What did Paul say? All have sinned and fallen short of the... Oh! So Adam and Eve lost the glory. That's the reason why Paul said, I'm groaning. I got a stomach ache. Why are you hurting so bad, Paul? Do you need some Pepto-Bismol? No, 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 I don't need that. What I need is further clothing. I'm not trying to be naked on the body, on the outside. It's just that I want to be so immersed in my spiritual clothing that this mortality is dunked, immersed in the sea of God's immortality. Yes. Wow. Paul caught the vision that we can be so glorified and the glory which God has given us, we can wear it in such degree that, my goodness, it swallows you up until all you can see, all you can think, all you can feel, all you can touch, all you can smell is God. Glory, glory. Yeah, glory. Hallelujah. Wouldn't that seem to curb your habits and your routines? <laughs> I think it would be pretty easy to develop new ones rather quickly, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. Well, this is what Paul's talking about. He said, we don't know one another after flesh anymore, which means absoluteness. Once you come into Christ, you're a new spiritual being. You can't judge things. The word judge, real simple, it means you can't come to an opinion or a conclusion or a verdict. Well, I'm hurting. It might look like I'm coming down with some type of problem. Am I? No, you can't do that anymore. I got the sniffles. Maybe I'm getting ready to get sick. You can't do that anymore. There's a tumor in my body. The doctor said maybe it's going to be cancer. You can't do that anymore. That's not the world that you live in. If you live in that world, you forfeit your right to experience the glory and the power of the world that you really come from. 
It's got to be one or the other. He's trying to tell you that real Christianity, real accepting Christ as Savior, is coming into a world where everything changes. All the rules change. Everything's different. Listen, folks, you've got to realize, even in the protection agency, if you're being followed by some people that want to kill you, and you need to get yourself a new identification, they'll tell you it only works one way. One way. When we give you a new identification... Anyone that comes with you, family, friends, they also have a new identification. But any one of your friends and family that don't come with you are no longer your friends and no longer your family. Right. You can never contact the world of which you once existed. If you do, they'll find you. That's what Paul is saying right here. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. Lord. Yeah. Woo, glory. Hallelujah. Hey, Amen. That's a healthy sneeze right there. See? You can't judge, come to a verdict. About nothing. <laughs> well, you I know, mean, I've been running and everything. No, you haven't been running. You're doing just fine. Because the real you is the one on the inside. Forget about the body. I said forget about the body. Glory, glory, glory. People spend so much time carrying on with their body. Right. Right. That they build a wall between them and God out of their spirit. You don't think if you got connected with God and enjoyed the presence of God living out of your heart that your body would actually be perfectly fine? I've proved it over the last four years. I've got more health in my body than I've ever had in a very long time. And 10 years ago, I should have died. My bowels perforated in me, and I've had about five surgeries on my intestines. I shouldn't have normal function of my body. But the reason that I do is because four years ago, I started getting the idea that let's just pay attention to my spiritual connection with God. Jesus, I'm going to hang out with you. You're going to hang out with me, and we're going to enjoy one another all day long. And I'm going to forget about everything else, everything else, especially my body. Why would I pay attention to it? Why does it matter? It's really not that important after all. And the more I've been hanging out with Jesus, the more fun I've been having, recognizing that he's everywhere, the more my body has started to do what? All of a sudden it's functioning again. And, and, and some doctor friends of mine, when I told them my situation, they said, well, that's nothing short of miraculous. There's no way your body should function normal. Are you all doing okay with that? Okay, well, let's talk a little bit then, right, real quickly here, if you go over to Matthew in chapter 6, about making some of those connections, okay? Do you think it'd be difficult to make a connection with God, seeing that He actually lives in you, and He strapped the tower to your back? Do you think it'd be difficult? Or maybe it's so simple that we've missed it by trying to make it hard. Now, I'm going to give you a statement. This is a really good one. You'll find that everything about connecting with God and experiencing God is extremely simple. It's just not easy. Yeah. Say what? Yeah. It's simple. It's just not easy. The not easy part is you have to retrain yourself, and most people don't want to retrain anything. That's where renewing your mind comes in. You've got to see yourself. I mean, even God said to Moses, Moses, he said, see, I have made you as God to Pharaoh. First thing he said was, see, you got to see it. I've made you as God to Pharaoh. In other words, if he doesn't see it, guess what? He'll always be talking to God as though God help us, save us, bail us out, do something for us. When God gave him the rod, which represented his presence, so that Moses could actually do what was needed to do. You know, God didn't have to give those plagues. Moses could have came up with himself. Well, uh, Moses, we're going to do frogs next. Oh, Lord, I really don't like frogs. Can't we do gnats? Oh, it's okay, do gnats. <laughs> Because God made Moses as God to Pharaoh. If God made him as God to Pharaoh, the only reason why he's helping him is because he doesn't understand what it's like to be God to Pharaoh. But if he got a clue and understood it, could he have orchestrated that? Yes, that's what God wanted. Hey, listen, if God wants to keep us babies, then he would have made Adam and Eve as little infants and had a whole bunch of fairies to, to just grow them up until he could talk with them. 
God made full-blown adults. Why? Fellowship. God wants us to grow and develop. He doesn't want to keep us at infant stage where we're always saying, God, please can you help me with this, and I need this, and I need this, and Lord God, you really got to do this for me. He's saying, well, wait a minute. Don't you get how I've made you? I made you in my image and my likeness, and I put my spirit on the inside of you and gave you every advantage, and yes, I'm for you. Who in the world could be against you? But you're the one that needs to grow, make choices to use and be responsible for the glory which you're full of. Hey. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for all that enthusiasm. <laughs> I'm still looking at some of you. <laughs> I'm not yet quite convinced you that it's a good thing, that what we're talking about. It's a wonderful thing. If it's a choice that gets me a click off, then it's a simple choice by His grace that gets me right back on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Look at what Jesus said right here in John 5. Oh, I went to John 5. Excuse me. I want you to go to John 6 and verse 19. John 6, verse 19. Didn't you know that? Oh, wait a minute. Matthew 6. I was just testing you. I want to make sure you're listening. <laughs> Sorry about that. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. In the Message Bible, Jesus says, Don't hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten by moths and corrupted by rust, or worse, stolen by burglars. Stockpile treasure in heaven where it is safe from moss, rust, and burglars. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is. Now, we know the King James says, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, right? Tell me this isn't good the way it's written. Where you, the place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and end up being. Yeah. Yeah. That pretty well pins your hide to the wall, doesn't it? Because you can't say, oh, I love him, I love him, I love him, I love him, if you're never with him. Come on, preach it. Come on. Oh, my God, there's a baseball game I'm going to this spring. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait to go. And you're so excited about it. Dancing with the Stars is on. Oh, my God, I can't wait to get home. <laughs> we, get we get excited about the most ridiculous of little things in this world that have absolutely zero to do with your relationship with God. But we can't wait to be there. And we drag ourselves to church. And when we get there, we actually feel like we've done ourselves a service because at least we're there. Come on. I know that that's not the majority of people here, but I'm saying it anyhow because that's the majority and high majority of people worldwide. And I'm not just talking about any sect or group. It's just pretty much down the line. Why? Because religion leaves out the relationship. It's a bunch of duties. Yeah. Amen. You're right. This, that's really good. He goes on to say, your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes in wide wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a dank cellar. If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you'll have. My uncle uh, from San Salvador, El Salvador, he's gone on to be with the Lord now. And my aunt was a missionary down there, so she married him. What a wonderful guy, but I never really could talk with him because he didn't speak any English. Jimmy! That's about it. <laughs> and she'd have to interpret, you know. But I remember one time before I was married, and uh, for anybody here getting married, this is really good. Or anybody that's married, this is some of the best marriage counseling you'll ever hear in just in 10 seconds. He said, Jimmy, before you get married, open both eyes wide. He said, after you get married, close one and squint with the other. <laughs> That's good, isn't it good? I mean, what you don't see, man, it'll bother you. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's 
Sad thing is, most of us got married with one eye closed and squinting, and then when we got married, before we got married, but then when we got married, we opened them both wide and went, ah! The reverse. <laughs> All right, I'm glad you're laughing because this next part pretty well goes right there. Look at what it says. You can't worship two gods at once. I'm a multitasker, though, Brother Jim. <laughs> no, no, no. There's no multitasking in the spirit. Amen. Oh, my God, I can do ten things at once. No, you're pretty well confused. Oh, no, I can really get them done. Maybe you get it done, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're focused on anyone. And if you pride yourself by being a multitasker and you don't learn the art of focus and concentration, that which doesn't seem to be so real will never be real. Come on, we're letting the world tell us that we're a bunch of airheads. Everything goes back to this, the, the, the stuff, what is it called, this, this disorder of uh, attention deficit disorder, all that kind of junk. In my day, if you had too much energy, your, your dad would kick you in the seat of the pants and say, another game of uh, kick the can. Get out there. You didn't take drugs for it. He just wore you down until you sleep real good all night long. We grew up in a generation where you couldn't hurt. I mean, literally, you'd be bleeding and your arm would be half off and your dad would say, you're fine, get up. Isn't that right? You were never hurt. Even the mothers didn't say, oh, honey, are you okay? They didn't say that. They said, get up, you're fine. That's right. Big old black guy came back from a fight. How you doing? Oh, you're fine. It'll go away in a day. Yep. Come on, get ready for school. Uh, Isn't it true? Yes. What were they teaching us? Stop feeding that. Don't give it so much value. Maybe it's not that important. We were being taught that years ago. Today, it's all about the flesh. Can't worship two gods at once. Loving one god, you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money both. So he goes on to say, so if you decide for God, living a life of God worship, it follows that you don't fuss at what's on the table at mealtime. The clothes in your closet are in fashion. We got all upset about fashion. All upset about whether or not we got the perfect food. Be thankful you got food. I came home from a trip. I said to my wife, honey, where are my jeans? She said, what jeans are you talking about? I said, well, you know what jeans I'm talking about. This was about nine years ago. And I had a pair of jeans that I had back when I was in high school. Because I haven't, I haven't changed size since I was in 10th grade. So I could wear them. They knew me as well as I knew them. <laughs> so I said to Erin, I said, where are my jeans? She said, which ones? I said, well, you know which ones. She said, well, you won't find those. I said, well, why won't I find those? She said, because I threw them out. <laughs> Why'd you throw out my jeans? She said, you embarrass me when you wear them. I said, they're jeans. You can wear jeans from any generation. As long as they're jeans, they're acceptable. She said, no, they're not. I said, woman, let me just tell you something about how this is going to work. You be going into my closet and messing with my clothes while I'm gone? I can't wait till you're gone. I'm, I'm going to throw out everything you own, even your undergarments. Do you understand what I'm saying? She leaned in a little closer. She said, do it. I'll buy new. Oh, yeah. I had no comeback. I turned around and walked away. Beaten at my own game. It says if... I can imagine you'd enjoy that. I can imagine. <laughs> I'll say it again. If you decide for God, God, living a God life of worship, it follows that you don't fuss at, about what's on the table at mealtimes or the clothes in your closet. There's far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach, more than the outer appearance, than the clothes you hang on your body. 
Now he's getting ready to help people make a connection. You're going to say when I'm done with this, oh, that's just too simple. Maybe that's what it takes for all of us. Yeah. For it to be so simple that we're going to have to slow down enough to get that simple. Yeah. Because then he begins to say what? Look at the bird. I went a little bit further than I should have. Just a second. Look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied down to a job description, careless in the care of God. I like that. And you count far more to him than the birds. Has anyone by fussing in front of a mirror even gotten taller by so much as an inch? All this time and money wasted on fashion. Do you think it makes that much difference? Instead of looking at the fashions, walk out into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never primp or shop, but have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The ten best dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside them. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of it, them which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, and do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. I was playing golf with a, a, a pastor friend of mine. We were in North Carolina. It was supposed to be real cold that day. Because see, remember, the more you begin to experience the grace of God, the grace of God, His influence, His enhancement, His presence, His ability, that's everywhere everywhere. It's like there's a nuclear explosion when Christ came out of the grave and there's been ash falling for 2,000 years and that ash is purple in color and you've got it all over you. You may wipe it off your shoulder but just as quick as you wipe it off it's right back on. It's everywhere. It's just whether or not you acknowledge it so that you can use it and experience it. And since I've been acknowledging it and enjoying it, then I would just expect that a day where it's supposed to be cold, although sunny, would just turn out in our favor. We got out there, and of course there's no one out there because it's supposed to be too cold, and yet with the sun shining and absolutely no wind, we started shedding layers off and we're enjoying this amazing day. The fall color was still all over and there's beautiful green on the, on the golf course and fall leaves everywhere. And we went down this one hill and around, you know, some of the big, huge, you know, uh, cattails and stuff in a little pond, went to the green and then beyond that was another big lake and that's where our tee box was for a little par three back up the hill. And I stopped and I said, Michael, do a 360 degree and take this in. And we just went like this. And you could hear ducks. And you could hear birds. And you saw everything that you saw. And it was just beautiful. Glistening still in the morning dew. And you looked like this. And I said, now, get this. But everything you've just witnessed is no different than someone coming out of a wheelchair. Than a cancerous patient ready to die. Instantaneously being healed. There's no difference. <clears throat> We're the ones that have minimized the beauty of what God has touched and maximized the hideousness of the enemy and his foul sickness and disease, yeah. trouble, despair, drama. Yeah. Think about the families that wake up. Why did you mean it like that? Well, I didn't mean it like that. Well, yes, you did. Well, no, I didn't. By the time you get out to the breakfast table, the kids are sitting there and they can feel the tension. They hear some harsh words and they think, mommy and daddy are having a problem. And next thing you know, they're struggling. They go to school and because they're struggling and insecure, they do something like hit somebody, they get in trouble. And now when they come home and get a report, you yell at them for what they just did. And that goes on and on and builds and builds. And that is people's reality all day long, every day. That's their world. Do you think at all that they could ever find God if it weren't for the fact that all bad choices and sins are forgiven? That at a moment's notice, snap your finger, oh, this is so wrong, God, please help. And there he is in his glory to change your world and your perspective so that you can see and then accurately begin to make choices that let him come right back in your home and fill it with glory and your kids have a smile on their face and feel the contentment of a father and mother who aren't at each other but actually use love to one-up each other. Oh, that's good. Thank you, Lord. Woo, Gloria, I'm feeling something right now. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why wouldn't somebody's hip in this place be healed right now? Hmm? Why wouldn't somebody's back in this place be healed right now? Right now where we stand. Without even coming up here, someone's spine's being aligned right now. Someone's hip's being healed. Pain's just disappearing right while I'm speaking. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for that. Someone's had a bad report. You've got, you've got fear mounting up, sitting on your shoulders, speaking into your ears of how bad it's going to get. Someone's had a bad report. Doctors have said some things about you. Your condition is not good. It's headed the wrong way, and it's headed the wrong way fast. Who is that in here? Anybody in here with a condition? Doctors have said something like that to you. Where are you? Right over there. Brother? Something so simple as what we just said, and a quickening to our spirit, and the Holy Ghost wants to demonstrate. Do you want a new report? Come on up here. This will be the last day of the world you are living in. What was it? It's undiagnosed. I don't know. Autoimmune disease, some sort of autoimmune disease. Now, here's the hideousness of how we actually let this world pollute us. We'll go, and even the doctors will say, I can't find what's wrong. And we'll say, but you've got to find something that's wrong. At least give me some pills. I mean, if the doctors can't find out what's wrong, maybe you ought to ask the other question, which is, maybe there's nothing wrong. <laughs> so maybe there's symptoms in your body that have been screaming at you. Maybe what they've said about you causes anxiety and fear to come on you. But today it's all going to leave. Amen. First the anxiety, then the fear, and then you can enjoy the wonderful presence of God and laugh. Go about your day. Tomorrow, have the best day you've had in weeks. Symptom free, not nothing in your way, and enjoy Jesus. Amen. And if any of that is even close to being true, and it'll all be true, just exactly like I said, then what's the possibility that tonight you're healed? And for the rest of your life, you don't have to have any more of that. If you'll even allow it to be a possibility, then in the name of the Lord Jesus, from this moment, binding something which has no power is very simple. But I release into you the glory of God which has all power. To cause your body to be free and your mind to be at rest and your soul to be full of joy from this day forward. Something so very simple, already purchased by Christ. We now release into you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh. Woo, glory. That's better than R-O-L-A-I-D-S. Amen. <laughs> You'll have yourself pretty, pretty humdinger of a day tomorrow. Amen. You may want to run. You may want to shout. Praise the Lord. You may, you may want to go out and eat something you haven't eaten in a long time. Like order yourself a medium pizza and eat the whole thing. And just something wild. Something crazy. Something that you normally wouldn't do. Whose hips in here are being healed? What about you? Where's all that pain gone from this morning? It's not there. What about your hips? Praise God. It's not there. So, is it possible not only are all the symptoms beginning to dissipate, but possibility that you're on your road to complete recovery? Isn't that right? Amen. Amen. That's exactly right. Now, was any of this holding you back from work and holding you back from responsibilities and activities? Life. So, what are you going to do tomorrow? Go back and just Live. lay in bed? <laughs> there you go. That's right, sis. Give me a high five on that. Glory. Amen. See, people that don't get it just sit back down and be the same old person they were, just feeling a little bit better. <laughs> See, now you understand why I said how you do life is how you do faith. If faith isn't working, it goes back to how you do life. People can get something right here, walk out the door, go back to what they consider to be reality, where they got their problems in the first place. You don't think those problems are going to come back? If you don't change the way you see things, change yes, the way you do things? Yes, Lord. I mean, for no other good reason. Sleep on the other side of the bed instead of the one that you've normally been on. <laughs> Put your cups on the other side. Yes, put, your put your silverware on the wrong Ooh. side if you have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
I mean, eat what you're going to eat with your spoon when you should be sticking it with your fork. I don't care. Whatever it is, change the way you see things because you're changed inside and out. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Who in here, whose spine's being healed right now? Anybody sense a change in your spine? Someone say, well, I don't know. I actually have to get up and bend over. Okay. Who told you you can't do that? See, so don't wait on me to say, hey, it's, it's, it's actually okay if you get up and bend over. No, just do it. This is what people did and how they received from Jesus. They didn't wait on anybody. They defied all the rules of the day to get what they needed to get when they knew they had an opportunity to get it. I'm going to read the rest of this real quick. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of them which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, and do his best for you? What I'm trying to get you to do here is to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over all these things. In other words, this is the way of the Gentiles, King James. The Gentiles seek after all these things. The life in America is the life of the Gentiles. Working hard, trying to get ahead, doing your best. Rubbing your two pennies together to keep it going. That's the life of the Gentiles. Jesus said, there's a better way. Notice what he said. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up at the time. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added. Unto. Added. God wants to add stuff to you. God wants to bring stuff to you. God wants to do the fathering type of stuff that when his kids just absolutely hang out with him all day long, he makes sure there's nothing wrong for you to go home to. Unfortunately, what we've done is, is we've messed that whole thing up where we talk about, well, there's a divine move of healing. Now there's a divine move of prosperity. Now there's a divine move of the joy of the Lord. What we should have always had every single day, every single year, all our lives is just a divine move of God knowing Him Himself. Because yeah. when you know Him, don't you get the provision? Don't you get the health? Don't you get the joy that comes with Him? You don't need a move to restore something when you've got Him. Amen. Oh. All the moves to bring something back only shows that people don't know God. So they need a goodie to hook them and bring them into the goodness of God. If you've got God himself, you've got all his goodies. But you don't necessarily care about them so much as you do hanging out with them. It's so cool to have God's voice. Like a parrot sitting on a pirate's shoulder. I'll just share a simple story of my friend BJ because I've had a similar experience. When he first got to know God and began to really experience Him extremely tangibly, he asked me one day, he said, Hey, do you got a good Holy Ghost? I said, Yeah, of course I do. I said, Why? Don't you? He goes, Man, I can't stand mine. I've got to turn him in for a new one. <laughs> now you got to understand, he doesn't know anything at all. This is all just his, his experiences of God. I said, what do you mean you got to turn him in for a new one? He said, doesn't he have anybody else to talk to? He just talks to me nonstop. He will not <laughs> shut up. He's literally bugging the fire out of me all day long. I can't get any rest from this guy. Are you kidding me? I didn't say anything. I just laughed. A month later, I, I, said, I thought, let's just let him figure it out. A month later, he writes me a little letter. He said, well, last night, I had it out with the guys. That's what he calls God, Jesus, the Holy Ghost. I had it out with the guys. <laughs> I told the Father, I need time out. I need a ruling on this Holy Ghost you gave me. I need a new one. <laughs> He's obviously got a problem because he can't shut up. 
And he said, the Father spoke to me. He said, now Jesus speaks quite a bit. He said, but the Father doesn't speak as much. But when he does, just ask Sodom and Gomorrah how good that gets. He said, he put me in my place so fast. He said, I hate to admit it, but he said, it's absolutely true. I've got a new best friend. His name's the Holy Ghost. What if the Holy Ghost could be that real, sitting on your shoulder, talking with you all day long? Wouldn't you enjoy the presence of God like you've actually got a friend? Come on, Rick Joyner just had an experience where, where he was driving on his motorcycle. and He was telling one of the guys on the It's Supernatural show, Sid Roth, he was, he was sharing with him. And he was almost dumbfounded while he was sharing it. Talking about how he got on his motorcycle and started riding. He said, it's like somebody jumped on the back of his motorcycle. It was God, and God was speaking in his ear the whole time for the two or three hours that he was driving. Speaking so clear, he could hear every single word like it was somebody speaking right there tangibly in his ear. And he said, this is what God said to him. He said, I'm, all I'm looking for are friends. He said, I want to be friends with somebody. In other words, I'm looking for somebody to hang out with. I'm looking for somebody to talk with that'll listen. No one's listening. They all just shut me off like that. Could it be real for all of us <coughs> to individually begin to know God even a little bit more? Wouldn't that be wonderful? And could a little bit more turn into a hunger where you began to be filled with a lot more? Glory. Praise God. There was a young man that was dating my oldest daughter a few years back, and he wanted to talk with me. So the fact that I said yes was really a miracle in the first place. <laughs> I'm the intimidator. My wife says, will you be nice to these young kids that like your daughters? I said, no, I'll have plenty of time for that later if they actually get by me. <laughs> she said, you're so mean to them. I said, my job is the intimidator. If they can handle me, then maybe they can have them. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> so I told him, all right, I'll meet with, I'll meet with you. He came over and sat down. He's a good kid. What's wrong? I've had three growths on my shoulder here. I don't know what to do. And I know that if I have a connection with God, there's no reason for them to be there. But I don't know that I've ever felt God. I said, you've never had any direction by God? Or? He said, well, I mean, I really felt like the Lord told me to pick up the guitar years ago. And of course, now he's at Berkeley School of Music. That's pretty good. I said, well, there you go, right there. You have heard from God. God is real to you. He goes, but I don't know if I know it, you know, any, any other than that. And then I shared with him experience about an individual that was in some of our meetings that she's in a, in a serious situation, and she's been like that for years and years and years, but she knows every single scripture, and if you ever have a problem as a preacher saying, I'm not sure where the scripture is over in such and such a place, she'll give you chapter and verse and quote it for you. So I said to him, does that bother you? He said, yeah, I keep thinking to myself, if you know all those scriptures, why don't you just experience God in your body? He goes, that's, I told him, I said, that's the grace of God. He said, it is? I said, yeah, the grace of God wants to shield you from that kind of stuff. Because otherwise you'll think it's okay, and then you'll start to operate like that too. So God's grace is trying to help you to show that's not normal. He goes, wow, I guess I have experienced him. I said, Ian, what I'm going to share with you now is just so simple. It's almost too simple. If you'll forget about those gross, they'll forget about you. We're in a meeting, and all of a sudden, he's stretching because he started to work out. He wanted to impress me. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I saw his eyes get big, and he lifts his hand, which he never would have done in a public meeting. I see it, Ian. What's, what's up? He said, they, they're gone. I said, what's gone? Uh, they're gone. Do you know when they left? No, you told me f forget about them. <laughs> I said, did they forget about you? Yeah, they're not there, they're gone. What's Jesus trying to tell us with all this? He's trying to show us that in our life all day long, there are experiences of God for us to see, witness, and acknowledge. We're missing them. We're missing, because we're so busy, the birds. 
Amen. He's trying to show us that there are such small little things that you think are insignificant that show that I'm real. Amen. And when you acknowledge one of those little things, then you'll begin to open and see more of them. What took place with Nathaniel? Nathaniel, well, there's an Israelite in whom is no guile. Nathaniel said, how do you know me? He said, I saw you under the fig tree. Yeah. <laughs> my Lord and my God. Remember that? What did Nathaniel do? He acknowledged how much it meant to him that Jesus knew him. So what did Jesus say in a real crass way? Say, well, there you go, boy. That's all you'll get in life. And walked away. Or did Jesus say what? It intrigued him that there was such praise to him over something so small as he knew him that Jesus then said, did you like that, Nathaniel? And he said, yeah. He said, well, if you'll hang out with me, you'll see heaven open up, angels will ascend and descend upon the Son of Man. Yeah. <laughs> Your acknowledgments of the smallest of little things all day long are an invitation for God to show you more. Amen. <laughs> Trust the Lord with all your heart. Come on, help me with it. And lean not unto your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways, and He shall direct your paths. Now let me help you with something, and then we close. To acknowledge God in all your ways means that God has to be personally present and willing to be involved in everything you do. So what does that say? But if we can go weeks without even having one experience with God, that we're just not wanting to see it because He's there every minute of the day trying to help us in everything we do. Amen. The smallest of little things. Somebody wrote on the radio show and they said, okay, I get the small stuff, the birds and the flowers, but I need something big now. And I wrote back and said, then you don't get it at all. Why do you think Jesus said it only takes a speck of faith to get rid of a mountain? Isn't a speck of faith like a speck of dust really in one sense disrespectful to the size of a mountain? And the answer would be yes. I mean, a mountain is a mountain, and a speck is nothing. Maybe that's what Jesus was saying. Your mountain is nothing. It's just the mountain you create. If he really did take our infirmity and bear our sickness, then didn't he level the playing field so there's nothing by any means shall hurt you? Amen. And if there's nothing that shall hurt you, then think of it, for you to say, I can see the birds and I can see the flowers, but I got something big means you've done nothing more than build yourself a mountain when it really is nothing at all. How about the guy that died in a commercial freezer? Sure enough, autopsy proved that he had hypothermia, but the freezer wasn't on. What about the guy that came to me talking about his mother-in-law that said she was the most cantankerous woman he'd ever met in his life, and in her 50s, she began to tell the whole family, the next person that gets cancer in this, this family will be me. She wanted some attention. The moment she said that, the whole family began to say, oh, oh, mama, don't say stuff like that. The moment they said that, she kept saying it because she got exactly what she wanted, attention. But before the year was out, she was the first one that got cancer. In the fight for her life against cancer, she came down with Alzheimer's and she came down hard, lost her mind. And the first thing that left her when she lost her mind was the cancer. Okay, so there you go. You all want to get healed? Let's just chop your heads off and get healed like that. Then we got to put them back on. See, what does it, that what? We're buying into and giving value to something that is nothing. But we give it our creative value and make it look like it's big, it's bad, it's ugly. And how in the world are we going to make it if the Lord doesn't help us? And all it is is us building our own mountain out of zero. Praise Him. Praise Him. Thank you, Lord.